Hi everybody, this is Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I'm author of the, the Snowball System Trainer. I and my teams have trained over 15,000 experts all over the world on sound, efficient, and authentic business development techniques. I've got a great, great episode for you today. I get a hoot out of being around Dory Clark. She and I met a couple years ago through a mutual friend. I was up in New York. We got to meet in person. Uh, I happened to be staying in a hotel really close to, to where she lives. We met at a Joe and the Juice, and uh, it was really, really fun. And she's just one of those people that you just absolutely love being around. One of those people that everybody around Dory is better off when they're around Dory. And I just have never forgotten that that vibe that she's got. So I was really excited to have her here on season two of Real Relationships, Real Revenue. In this first episode, what we're gonna talk about is Dory's big idea. And my favorite book of her so far is the book Stand Out. I think it's absolutely phenomenal, but we ask, or I ask her in this episode for the big idea that she has that can help us really like uh, systemically grow our books of business, grow our relationship ecosystem, our relationship advantage, and grow our career. And what's neat is we were able to get a little sneak peek into her new book that's not even out yet. It's called The Long Game. And we're able to get a little bit of content out of Dory's head as she's writing the book itself. Really excited about that. Never done that before on the show. So just be ready for this because you get to sneak inside Dory's head and see what the long game is all about. And I was impressed. So before we do that, don't forget, if you want our weekly digest on how to get some great ideas in a really power packed way, use something you can read in four or five minutes, then just head over to Grow Big playbook.com growbigplaybook.com so that you can get our weekly digest, which is called Grow Big Playbook. So here we go. Here's our first episode with Dory Clark. Hi, everybody. It's Mo Bunnell. Welcome to Real Relationships, Real Revenue. And as you know, we've got a treat for you today. I'm with Dory Clark, who has an immense expertise, somebody that I look up to. I've met with in person. I look up to her as a human being. I look up, look up to her as expertise driven. And she is incredibly good at teaching people how to figure out what they want to do, how to stand out in a crowd, and how to let the world know about your expertise. And what's super cool about the couple episodes that we're gonna tape right now is Dory is gonna give you a sneak peek into her new book coming out. So Dory, first question to you, what's your big idea when it comes to business development? You know, people that are professionals or account managers at big service-based companies, they've got one foot in the delivery of some complicated service, and they've got one foot in retention and growth, the hybrid sales role, if you will, toughest role in the world. What's your big idea on how they can do better? Thank you so much, Mo. So my new book is called The Long Game, How to Be a Long-Term Thinker in a Short-Term World. And one of the key things that we're talking about is something that I think almost every professional, but especially, you know, the, these high, you know, highly educated, super smart uh, professional service providers grapple with all the time is the idea of, of just balancing these long term and short term needs. I mean, obviously, we need to drive revenue, we need to bring in business. We also are looking around. We've got we've got social media. We've got all these these sort of competitive things happening, and it seems like sometimes it's working so fast or so well for other people. And yet we also hear the message, you know, perhaps softer and quieter, that oh well, it, it takes time. You have to be patient. It's not about overnight. It's about long term relationship building. That's what really drives results. And meanwhile, you look around and you're like, yeah, but I I need I need something now. So how do you thread that needle. That is what we are really trying to tackle and talk about in the book. And so ultimately, one of the, the biggest things that I, I talk about when it comes to networking, you know, the word that so many people hate, uh, and, and really just building your network of people is that there are three major ways that people network. And the first one is is the one that that frankly gets talked about the most and it's it's the one that that people I think justifiably hate which is short term 
networking. It's all about what do you need tomorrow? Well, I need to make a sale. Okay. Who can I call? I've got to make this sale. I've got to meet somebody and do this. And it feels predatory because frankly, it is predatory. All you are looking for is what can I extract from someone? And so instead, you know, and again, it's fine if you, if you already have a relationship with someone and you have a, a new product or something like, great, you can call them up. You know, we're pals. Hey, Mo, I have a new thing. Are you interested? G- yes. Great. No. Okay. No worries. Well, if you hear of anybody, let me know. That's fine. But for people that you are meeting, you can't go in with that mentality. You need to either have long-term networking or what I call infinite horizon networking. Mm. And the, the difference really is for long-term networking, you don't necessarily know what the person can get you. You, you have a, you know, perhaps a, an idea, a suspicion that they might be a useful contact at some point. You know, maybe they're a prominent person in your industry or they're a potential buyer, but you don't know, is it, is it tomorrow? Is it six months? Is it six years? But you're developing that relationship with the long-term mindset saying, I am, I am explicitly not trying to get something from this person tomorrow. I'm getting to know them. And that it becomes the basis. And then infinite horizon networking is something totally different. The person literally, you might not have any, anything in common with them. You might not have any idea how they could be helpful to you, to you professionally. They could be an astronaut. They could be a comedian. They could be a dog trainer. But the whole point is that they are interesting and you cultivate these relationships because the thing that we see again and again is that, you know what, you never know where people end up over time. And it's these relationships, the random relationships that sometimes turn out to be 20 years later, the ace in the hole where you say, oh my God, you know, you know, suddenly, uh, the, the astronaut is working at a consulting firm and you know, they're the person who can hire you or, oh my gosh, the comedian is now the head of a television network and they want to bring you in to be the, the auditor for it, whatever it is. But it's about having that, that infinite perspective of, you know what, I don't know where it's going to go, but this is going to be interesting. Oh, Dory, I love it. Follow up question. So with this infinite horizon idea, is the is it that you're really looking to be helpful in any way possible and you just got no expectation of anything in return? Yeah, it's I mean, it's about being helpful. But honestly, I mean, it's about meeting cool people, right? We we sometimes when we think about networking so often it feels like it has to be a chore like, oh, I have to do my networking. I, I want to try to inject a little bit more joy into the process. Like, how cool is it to meet cool people? Like, don't we all kind of want to be friends with astronauts? Like, that's just neat. And because they become your friends, of course you want to help them. But I also think sometimes a place where we go wrong with networking is the person who's like the overeager puppy. Like, tell me, how can I be helpful to you? And it's like, I, I don't know. I just met you. Like, it's like, it's like, don't put all that pressure. I have no idea. You know, it's like, just treat them like, hey, I want to get to know you. That's enough. I'm laughing because this is how we met. You know, our mutual friend Dave's like, I don't know what's going to happen, but Mo, you're writing a book and Dory has a bunch of books and I just really like her. So just meet when you're in New York. And I was in New York and we met at Joe and the Juice and it was fun. And I don't know what was supposed to happen, but really good things happen. I signed up for your newsletter. I got great advice. I found a book for my daughter. I mean, just all kinds of random things have happened. So so one last follow-up on this on this topic, and we'll wrap up this episode because I'm interested in this. I My guess is all the business professionals getting bombarded. They're trying to get to inbox zero. They got a reorg they just went through. They're afraid of the next one that's coming up. That's actually a client I was just talking with. And, <laughs> and they would say, I love this idea, but how do I make the time? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, we are all pressed for time. It, it's a, it's a stressful world, no doubt. What I like to suggest is a couple of things. Number one, I, I firmly believe that all of us can find an hour in our week. You know, it's, it's really just a question of what we're prioritizing. And so it's, this is not saying you have to spend 20% of your time doing this. It's really, you know, this is very much a, a kind of compound 
interest type thing, right? So if you can find one hour a week to say, you know what, all right, I'll have coffee with one person or, you know, even a half an hour now that we're doing Zoom calls, right? It doesn't, it doesn't take that much to say, okay, I'll have a, I'll have a chat if the person seems legitimately interesting. I think that's very doable. I also am a fan personally of networking in bulk, I guess you could say, which uh, which used to be having dinner parties in person. Uh, now, uh, in the pandemic, I have uh, taken to having virtual cocktail parties, which enables you to invite a bunch of people. And, you know, so you have eight people, 10 people even, and you do a, a virtual cocktail party and you get to know folks that way. And folks are often very appreciative to be invited because frankly, you know, in a pandemic, they're not invited to a lot of things. And it's a chance to get to know uh, other folks, uh, you know, all, all at the same time. So those are a couple of ways that you can be quite efficient in your networking. I love it. Okay. I promised only one more question. I've got one more, just one more, but I think it's a good one. I love your litmus test. A couple times here, you've used this very specific word, interesting. People that you find that are interesting. Is that the right way to look at this? Because that seems like you'd want to free up that hour. You know, if you just found somebody who's interesting, you want to get to know them. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I actually have have another concept I talk about in my forthcoming book, The Long Game, uh, which is going to be coming out in September from Harvard Business Review Press. And I actually call the concept optimize for interesting because, mm. we, you know, as we think about how do we spend our time, how do we make decisions about our professional life? You know, the default in our culture, of course, is like optimizing for money. And then some people reject that. They say, oh, that's so crass. That's so craven. I don't want to do that. And so then the pressure is like, will you optimize for meaning? Well, that's that's great if you have this cause that you're so passionate about. But there's a lot of people that are like, ah, you know, I don't I don't really know. Like, you know, if you, if you are not, you know, going off and building wells in Africa or whatever, what does that mean for you? How do you choose if there's not like, you know, some North Star that's been uh, inexorably guiding you? And what I suggest is, you know what? do what's interesting. Mm. Everybody has things they're interested in. It doesn't have to mean it's like the most profound thing in the world, but if you follow your curiosity, it will almost certainly lead you in interesting directions. I love it. Meet with interesting people and you'll go in interesting directions. Cool. Dory, fantastic. I love this. Where, what, what can people do to take the next step to you with you to learn more? Yeah, thank you so much, Mo. Well, I will steer people. I uh, have a, a book where I talk about a number of these concepts. Uh, not not the one that is not out yet, but uh, there's a precursor uh, called Stand Out. And if folks are interested in learning more about that, checking it out, and uh, also uh, getting access to a free self assessment to help them think through how to how to actually really determine what is most unique about themselves, identify a breakthrough idea that they can leverage in their professional life. They can get a free standout self-assessment and they just can go to doryclark.com slash join, J-O-I-N. I love it. Hey, Dory, do you want to finish with a magic trick? Are you ready? This oh, is unscripted. Let's, let's Here we go. Right. Let's do it, man. All right. Hold on. I hope there's a rabbit. It is. It's close to a rabbit. It's even better. It's your standout book. It's right here. It was right here the whole time. <laughs> So I'm glad you brought it up. I know we didn't talk about doing that. Well, folks, um, (laughs) that's our first of four great questions that we're going to ask Dory. I love it. And I can't wait to reveal the next episode where we're going to ask Dory. I'm going to ask Dory, hey, how can we use this big idea? How can we use the concepts in her upcoming book, Playing the Long Game, um, The Long Game, about how to bring in more opportunities. So we're gonna, it's gonna get interesting because we're gonna see where Dory's gonna take this, but it's all gonna be about building a book of business and how can these comp- uh, how can these concepts help you with that? So stay tuned for the next episode. Hey everybody, it's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I'm back again with Dory Clark, one of the people that I think is the best experts in the world about standing out. We had a funny ending to our last episode on that. And in this one, I'm going to ask Dory a really pointed question. We chatted last time about her upcoming book, The Long Game. I can't wait to get it. And well, I'll let I'll give the floor to you in a sense, Dory, but how can people use the concepts in The Long Game to grow their book of business, to bring in more opportunities, 
at the end of the day, we've got to have commercial success or we don't, we don't keep our job. So how can people use the concepts in the long game to do just that? Absolutely. Thank you, Mo. So one of the things that I have been thinking about a lot in writing the long game is about how we can actually be preparing for these sort of larger goals that we have, right? I mean, one of the things that frustrates a lot of people is they they have some kind of a goal, you know, it could be a, uh, a big, meaningful goal, and it seems so unattainable in the moment because they have the press of responsibilities. They have all the other things they need to do. You know, how can they ever make the time to accomplish this or to get to the place that they want to go? And one of the things that I have been really fascinated about, and I interviewed a lot of people about how this played out, is something that many of us have perhaps heard about. Uh, it was first uh, created by 3M in Minnesota, popularized by Google, but something that I think is really important for all of us to adopt in our own personal lives is the concept of 20% time. And for folks who might not be familiar with it, it's the idea, uh, apparently, depending depending on who you talk to, uh, Google used to do this more than they currently do it, but you know, some people say, no, no, it's, it's still a thing. Uh, so, you know, TBD. But basically the idea is that you, as a professional, as an employee, can devote up to 20% of your time on a special project. And you choose what it is. It benefits the company, but you have discretion in what that thing is. And it's intended to be experimental. You know, you're building your skills. You're working on something that you think is interesting and uh, has potential. And you know, that's that's great for people at Google, but I, I actually think that we all need to seize the mantle on it because the issue is you can accomplish almost anything. You can build the kind of business, the kind of practice that you want. The issue is what is your runway? Because if you're talking about making huge changes, of course that can't happen overnight, right? But if you are planning methodically, really powerful things can happen. In fact, in my very first book that I wrote, and I have a prop of this right here. It's called Reinventing You. Uh, I tell the story of a, a woman named Patricia Fripp, who was, a, of all things, she was a hairdresser, and she wanted to reinvent herself into being a professional speaker, which is kind of a big transition. But for her, she actually was so incredibly methodical. I think we can really learn from this. She had a 10-year lease on her salon, and she said, you know what? That's my runway. And so the first few years, you know, she, whatever money she made from speaking, not a lot, uh, she would just, uh, you know, sort of reinvest it in all the things she needed, the, the website, the web design, um, get business cards, all of that. Later on, she was making a little bit more money. She invested it in herself. She invested in training so she'd get better. She really worked on leveling up her skills. And over time, she got more and more exposure, more and more experience. By the time year 10 rolled around, she was able to shut down her salon, walk away from the lease, and she had more than made up her salary. There was, there was, you know, people often talk about, oh, you know, you, you make a leap, you, you know, you dive off, you know, the cliff. You don't have to dive off any cliff. If, even if you have an audacious goal, if you give yourself enough runway and you devote small amounts of time to it, your own 20% time, there's, there's very, very little risk. That's the whole point. Patricia didn't have, oh, you know, the year when she ate ramen, she didn't have to because she was so methodical about it. And that's what 20% time allows us to do is to really reach for big goals, but do it in a way that de-risks the proposition. I like that. So to go a step deeper, if we talk about bringing in more business, growing our book of business, getting more yeses, getting more opportunities, that idea of 20% time could be uh, developing a killer keynote speech that you're going to use to meet new people. It could be developing an, an amazing analysis that you're going to go offer potential clients to be able to put them through at no charge to figure out how you might be able to save them money, help them money. Uh, make the process better, do a strategy session, whatever. We call that a give to get, something that people can see you in action while you work with them to create demand for them to hire you. So those are just a couple examples, but that sounds like that's where you're going, where we've got to dedicate time to basically build out our business development infrastructure to build our brand so that we can win more opportunities. Is that sort of where you're headed? 
That's exactly right, Mo. And it could be developing unique IP that enables you to reach people in new ways. Maybe it's starting a podcast, for instance, which can attract clients to you. That's a great use of 20% time. Maybe, in fact, it's networking related because you might say, you know what, I'd really like to go deep in this particular community. I really want to get to know people that are in this field or that live in this area, uh, you know, whatever it is. But if you invest enough time, you know, if you join the clubs, if you go to the meetings, if you're involved in that community, then over time you do become the trusted choice that people know and are familiar with. And they say, oh, right. You know, you know, oh, he does that. And it enables you very seamlessly to be able to attract more business rather than just this brute force of like, oh, my God, I don't know anyone. I guess I'll cold call them, which, you know, we know how well that works. Yeah, it is no fun. You know what? This um, reminds me of a little bit on, on a grander scale, and this will be our last question. We'll finish up this episode, but it seems like I, I read somewhere where you know coming up with a to do list, but not allocating time on your calendar, you know, to do that to do just on a weekly basis is a recipe for disaster because you could have a to do this this line, you know, that's going to take ninety hours of work, but you only have forty hours to do it in or whatever. I think what you're saying here is sort of the long game version of that, where if you want to become a recognized expert in something, if you want to stand out, if you want to build a business development process that actually works, that takes time. And you're saying like, hey, you've got to over a long period of time, quarters, years, whatever, start to dedicate the time to build out that business development infrastructure, whether it's relationships or systems or analysis or tools or whatever, to really be successful. Well put, Mo. Yes, exactly. Good. Man, this is awesome, Dory. Okay, last question. People are going to want to get more of Dory. So what do they do to take the next step with you? Well, thank you so much. You were alluding earlier uh, to folks who might want to become a recognized expert. And uh, that's something that I talk about a lot. I actually have a course that I offer on it. Um, but even more to the point, I have a free self-assessment for folks uh, called the Recognized Expert Self-Assessment. And it's a, it's a scored analysis that helps you understand specifically where you are strong and where you are weaker in terms of your public brand as an expert and provides a diagnostic tool so that you can really think about, well, where would the biggest ROI be if I was to spend time there. So it can help with exactly what we're talking about. Where should you be spending your discretionary 20% time? So for folks who are interested, you can get it for free at doryclark.com slash toolkit. Doryclark.com forward slash toolkit, right? That's it. Yeah. What's that? What's that old maxim in um, advertising? Got to say something three times. So Dory, was that doryclark.com forward slash toolkit? I think, Mo, it was doryclark.com <laughs> slash toolkit. <laughs> I love it. All right, folks, if you don't mind, go to doryclark.com forward slash toolkit because that's where you're going to get that awesome self-assessment. I, I want to do it. I don't know how I haven't stumbled across that on your site. So anyway, folks, go do that. We're wrapping up this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. I did. And if you haven't listened to the one before it, make sure you do that because there's some really great insights. I'm not going to tell you what it's about, but it was interesting. And on their next question, we're going to ask Story, how do you use the tools in her upcoming book, The Long Game, to develop relationships, to create a relationship advantage? So that's coming next. Hi, everybody. It's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. We have taped two killer <laughs> killer episodes. And I was going to say, I think we had, Dory, I think 20, I say at least 6% more laughter than a usual podcast episode. So if you, folks, if you haven't listened or watched to the last tip, last two, you got to do it. They're really good. In this episode, we're going to ask Dory a little bit different question. And we're going to ask her with the concepts in her new upcoming book, The Long Game, how can we use those concepts? We're getting a little sneak peek today. How can we use those concepts to establish and build the relationship advantage? Dory, what's your answer to that one? All right. I love it. Well, building strong relationships is something that's really important to me, Mo, as well, in terms of the work that I do with clients, you know, as a consultant and an executive coach as well. So I'm definitely on the same page as your listeners. And one of the strategies that we talk about in the long game is actually, and I think this is, is probably answering it in a slightly different way than you intended, but I think it's an important point to raise, 
is how to think through turning down offers and how to make sure that you are clearing your plate so that you actually have the time and space to connect with the right people. As we get more successful as professionals, we are more in demand and it almost seems inevitable that uh, a large percentage of the people that want to spend time with us are actually maybe not the people we should be spending time with. They are folks who, you know, want to pick our brains or they're people who just, they, they don't really seem to have a conception that we might be busy or have other things to do. And it can be really hard and challenging to make that transition because we want to be nice. We want to pay it forward. We might have connections to some of these folks, uh, even if uh, tenuous ones. And so it it becomes really challenging to figure out, okay, how, how can I actually, in a nice way that is able to somehow preserve a relationship, deflect this so that I have the time and space to allocate to the relationships that really matter? So that's, that's one of the, the pieces that I talk about is really thinking through how do we say no more often and feel comfortable doing it? Well, you can't just leave us there. Tell us how to do it. I got to hear more. <laughs> nice. All job. right. I'm curious. Well, I'm very curious. For sure. Well, one of the strategies that I've actually found to be most effective, and this this seems very ironic and uh, and basic in some ways, but it is a hidden powerful tool, is simply asking for more information. Because what I have really learned over time uh, from my own experiences and also from the, the folks that I advise, you know, the, the, the different clients that I work with, there is a fairly large percentage of people that will reach out and they have they already have a sort of go-to solution in mind. Oh, hey Mo, can you hop on a call for an hour with me? Oh, can we get a coffee? You know, whatever it is. They they will often won't even tell you what it's about, but they say, can we can we do this thing? And oftentimes when I was when I was less experienced professionally, I would be just sort of you know, bullied into it by assuming, oh, well, if if they're asking for an hour of my time, they must need it. Like it must be something important. No, they they often have just no idea they're asking for it because they're asking for it. So the simple act of saying, hey, Mo, um, what would you like to talk about? It sometimes is so incredibly powerful because it, it turns out, OK, Oftentimes they might have an erroneous perception of what you do. Oh, Dory, I wanted to ask you for advice about um, how to start a career in, uh, you know, in international trade. Well, gosh, Mo, I'd really like to help you, but I don't know anything about international trade. You know, I, I good luck, but I'm not your your woman, you know. And so you can you can veer them off. Other times, uh, people might just not have anything really formed. Oh, hey, Dory, I want to have a job like yours and I'd like some advice. Well, okay. In that case, you know, we can already tell this is going to be a complete waste of time. They haven't done any research. So you can, you can actually push back and say, oh, well, that's so wonderful. I'm really excited here. You know, this book and this book have been really helpful and influential to me. Why don't you read them? And then when you have, you come back and then we'll meet. And if just by making them go through some basic hoops, you often lose 30 to 40 percent of the people. And this is actually great. You want to lose these people because it is the other people, the persistent people, the responsible people that are the ones that are worth your time. So that that early screening mechanism can be quite valuable. Oh, I love it. So let's play. Let's go one more on this one. So let's say um, somebody asks for some time and you make them go through some hoops. So when I think of our clientele, it'd be a little less, it'd be a little different than that last example, although that makes sense, right? But say somebody's an account executive at, um, at a big healthcare company, for example, and they're being asked to do something by um, some group that, that has them track things. They want to report. They want a whole bunch of stuff filled out. Let's use your method on that. How could we, how could we use the method in like in that scenario? Does that even make sense? Well, I, I think that, you know, one, one way that we can often do it, I mean, there's, there's a few buckets of solutions that I suggest to people, right? So if we want to dispatch with things quickly, so number one, that, you know, always the triage is you ask for more information. Okay. Yeah. What do you want to talk about? What, what is it? So number two, is really sort of um, asking for a certain amount of granularity as well, right? Mm -hmm. So for instance, 
Um, this here's a great example. I uh, am working on a project with some folks. They said, oh, we we want to have a 45 minute call with you. I'm not sure. You know, how did they come up with 45 minutes? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not convinced that's the, the exact right number. Uh, we want to have a 45 minute call with you to go over uh, the shooting plan for our for our filming that's going to take mm -hmm. place next week. OK, yeah. well, you know. I'm sure we need to talk about it a little bit. I'm not convinced we need to talk 45 minutes about it. So asking for an agenda in advance like can that. be very valuable. Yeah, keep because, going. This is great. Yeah, that way you're able to scan through it. Um, some things you're going to actually want to have a legitimate conversation with. Others, you know, people sometimes, like they'll literally read this thing. They'll walk you through, well, Dory, you need to arrive by noon and here's the address. And it's like, it's on the document. So I'm actually good with that. Why don't we skip to number four? Because that's the thing that we need to, to really process. So you can make it go faster is another great way to do it. Um, another possibility is to say, well, is there a different way you could do it? Could you do it asynchronously? So you could say, okay, um, you know what? Oh my gosh, I'm so busy. I have calls all day tomorrow, but could you just email me you know, the question you have or the questions you have, I'll send you a voice memo. And then, you know, great. You're able to to bang it out in the car on the way home or whatever. And you don't have to actually take time when you're in the middle of your work day to be doing it. So those are some strategies. Also, if somebody wants to meet uh, a classic one that I like to suggest is meet when, um, you know, invite them to something you're already doing. So, you know, back when we get back to the real world and people are going to events, if you're already planning to, you know, go to the networking night at the Chamber of Commerce or whatever, just invite them to come along. Or you could actually host an event, you know, oh, well, I'm hosting a virtual cocktails. Why don't you come to it? And then you can connect with, with people at the same time. I love it. Something you were already doing. And then they'll get that sort of that check. They can check the box on their end. I got some time with Dory. But the, yeah. you didn't have to spend the extra one hour with somebody. It makes it scalable. I love it. I love it. This was super helpful. How do people, I know they're going to want to devour more of your big brain. So obviously they can't meet with you for an hour, but when, uh, what, what's the best way for somebody to take the next step with you and learn more about all the work that you do? Well, thank you, Mo. I appreciate it. Well, for many of the folks that are listeners of yours, um, one of the things that you have to think about is is rainmaking and bringing in business and being smart about uh, all the client acquisition and business development stuff. And I actually wrote a book that deals with a lot of that called Entrepreneurial You. It's about how do you create multiple streams of income in your business? And I think hopefully is useful for anyone who has revenue generating responsibilities. And so so for folks who would like a taste of it, a free taste, uh, they can get the Entrepreneurial You self-assessment at doryclark.com slash entrepreneur. I love it. Thank you. All right. Everybody go check that out. Doryclark.com forward slash entrepreneur. All right. In our next question, we're going to talk to Dory and get her best advice on how to hack your own habits, keep yourself accountable, and keep doing these great things that she's sharing with us. So join. Look for that next. Hey everybody, it's Mo Bundle, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue. I have just had a ball uh, hanging out with Dory Clark, talking about her advice around a big idea to help you with your business development skills. If you haven't seen that first episode of four that we're doing with her and then one is a wrap, make sure you do that. We talked about how do you bring in more business specifically? How do you develop relationships specifically? And check this out, I've got so many notes. I had to go get a new card to take more notes <laughs> in learning from Dory. So here's our last question of Dory. I think it's really an interesting one. Dory, you're, you, you know so much around uh, developing entrepreneurs, about standing out in a crowd, about finding your big idea and building a brand, brand about it. You've got a new book coming out called The Long Game. Tell us how people can hold themselves accountable in their busy world of getting distracted all the time. How can people hack their own habits and keep doing the things that you've been telling us about? Fantastic question, Mo, because of course it is true. Many of us know what we should be doing, uh, but it becomes a lot harder in the implementation because we are busy. We are pulled in a million different directions. And so actually in the long game, one of the, the places that I start, the very first chapter, 
is about this question of why exactly we're so busy. Um, one of the, the really arresting statistics that I read in the course of my research is that 97 percent of senior leaders said that strategy is one of the most critical aspects of their job. And of course, that's probably not surprising, right? Every, oh, you know, a senior leader, right? They need to set the strategy. They need to be smart about that. Meanwhile, a separate study said that 96% of senior leaders said they didn't have enough time for strategy. And just if we think about that for a minute, if we zoom out, we realize, okay, literally Almost everybody, everybody except for 1% of people said that one of the most important aspects of their job, they don't have time for what is going on. What is possibly going on? I mean, yes, there's a lot of meetings and emails, but come on. So one of the very first things that is important is that we actually, I think, have to get honest with ourselves because the truth is, as I sort of uh, discovered in the course of writing this and researching it, Many of the constraints of busyness are actually things that in some ways we are putting on ourselves. Mm. Now, of course, it is true you are busy. You have lots of things, lots of obligations. But there is actually, for many of us, a culture of busyness that – and research by Columbia University has, has shown – that busyness, especially in Western societies, often equates to self-worth. And we feel better about ourselves if we're busy. We often use busyness as a way of distracting ourselves sometimes from difficult questions about what I should be doing or where is my life going or should I actually be in this job or whatever it is. So really facing that and saying, okay, I, what would it look like if I, if I actually didn't feel like I had to be so performatively busy is one question that I've actually been grappling with a lot uh, myself personally. And I think as we also go through and really get clear on, well, what is important? What do we want to be doing? Another strategy that I wanted to mention that, that I talk about in the long game, which is coming out in September of 2021, uh, is about pr the power of pre-commitment. And this is something that is really a useful tool. I mean, we first, we first, uh, if we go back to, to Greek mythology, we, we know about it, uh, in the Odyssey when, uh, Odysseus is, is strapping himself to the mast because he knows he has heard that the sirens are, you know, so their, their sound is so captivating. Everybody just commits suicide basically by throwing themselves into the water to get closer to the sound. What does he do? He stuffs his ears with wax preventatively because he knows that he is going to be tempted. And so similarly, how can we set up structures in our lives that actually help push us to better behavior? I mean, obviously hiring a, a gym trainer is way one of the most classic examples of this. But are there accountability groups? Are there just even an accountability partner that we can use? How can we strategize? There's a woman that I profile in the book named Kim Cantor Gianni, and I love her story. She decided she wanted to finally get serious about weight loss, and she actually did a, a pound-a-thon, she called it, with her friends, where they agreed to pledge a certain amount of money uh, for every pound that she lost to a battered women's shelter. So she, she really felt like, oh my gosh, I, you know, I, if I'm going out with people, if I'm like out in town, I cannot afford to be seen with the Snickers bar because I'm literally letting down battered women. Like if you create those structures for yourself, it enables you uh, much more easily to make the habit of good behavior rather than bad patterns. I want to I want to double click on this because I think it's really powerful. I loved all the stats you shared, the 97 and 96 percent. Um, I love this idea of the power of pre-commitment. So double click on that. Put yourself in the shoes of a busy professional, a consultant. They've got one foot in delivery of some big uh, bunch of projects that have been uh, purchased and they've got one foot into they've got to focus on business development going forward, but they just feel overwhelmed. They're working 80 hours a week. How could pre-commitment help that person, that extreme example, just do as much as they potentially could squeeze in during this busy period so they don't emerge from the other side and haven't done anything over months and months and months. Absolutely. Well, 
oftentimes it's about thinking what what is even more painful than doing the thing you're supposed to do. So I'll give you an example. Um, for a lot of us, especially, you know, responsible, high achieving professionals, we really hate to break commitments. Mm -hmm. And so if you were to, you know, if you have an assistant, you can have an assistant do it, you can do it yourself. But if you were to proactively set up networking lunches, let's say, or a Zoom call or whatever, and you do it eight weeks in advance, you have it on the calendar. And in the moment, you might feel so busy. Oh, oh, I can't do it. I can't do it. And then you realize, oh, God, I'm going to have to cancel. And like, they're going to be insulted. Or I have to even worse, I have to cancel and then reschedule. And whoa, when am I going to do it? I don't have any time. It's easier to just do it. And you, you will find the time you will make, you will make the time to do it. We all are familiar with Parkinson's law that the work will expand to the time that we have to fill it. And so if you have carved out the hour or the half an hour previously, it often is much easier to just go ahead and do it rather than play cleanup and spend another hour trying to, to reschedule it. And so if we do that, we can actually enforce and reinforce the good habits that we want to have. I love that. In, in the idea of setting up ahead of time, it'd be a whole lot easier to continue those dialogues with other clients, keeping the relationship warm, being helpful, all that kind of stuff. That's a whole lot easier to squeeze that in during the busy periods then emerge six or nine or 12 months later and have talked to anybody like, hey, I was really busy. I really didn't care about you. And now I'm back. You know, that's not a good message. That's almost harder. So I love this idea. I, let me ask you one last question on this topic. And, and I'll ask um, uh, some a closing question about how people can connect with you. But the last question is one, one thing we found that's really helpful in some coaching that we were doing is while we were going through all this like mental gyrations with somebody trying to help him figure out or a small group of people trying to figure out how, what was less important than business development? We're like, well, this is important. That's important. Everything's important. But when they would do business development activities early in the day, the rest of the day would just sort of sort itself out, right? And I feel like maybe that's a pre-commitment idea is if you do the hardest or long game kind of things first, the rest of the day will sort itself out. Is that an angle to this too? I, I think that's great. Absolutely. Yes, because you know, it's, it's like doctor's appointments, right? Like if you, if you're, if you're going to have a doctor's appointment, you usually want to be the first one there, not the last one there, because there's this cascade of lateness where, you know, you might be the first one in at eight o'clock in the morning, but if you have the four 30 appointment, well, oh my gosh, you're still waiting there at, at, you know, five 15 because everybody before you has been three minutes late and five minutes late and it adds up. So if you can get the thing done, you just knock it off. You, you know, you write the email, you make the phone call, you do what you need to do, um, then it's, it's much better because otherwise all of the chaos of the day, like you might've planned to do it at, you know, at five o'clock at night, but just, it, it has been swamped by the tsunami and it's never going to happen. I love it. I hope somewhere in the book, the long game, the phrase cascade of lateness is in there because that's really good. I wrote it down. I love it. Um, this has been great. So I've just loved doing these four episodes with you. This is our last one together. The next one, I'm going to recap all this great stuff that I learned, apply it specifically to business development. Let me sing your praises a little bit more. But what do people do to take the next step with you? You know, based on this content we did right now, what's the next right thing someone should think about? I, I appreciate it, Mo. That's fantastic. Well, one of the best ways that folks can can stay in touch is through email. Um, I have an email list, which uh, in many cases and in many hands is a boring thing, but I try extremely hard for it not to be a boring thing. And in fact, Forbes did an article about uh, the top email lists that, that you must subscribe to that actually have value for professionals. I was proud that mine was on it. Uh, so if folks would like to see for themselves, they can go to doryclark.com slash subscribe. doryclark.com forward slash subscribe. You got it. We got it. And folks, I've been on the list for years. Not only do I glean insights from, from Dory's emails, but I found a really great holiday present for my daughter on that list a couple of years ago. And that gave us a chance to exchange, which is really good. So, you know, I didn't expect benefits like that. I thought it was more professional stuff. And most of it is I've gotten a lot out of Dory's email list. But hey, when you can please your daughter and they think you're cooler, that's a... <laughs> 
that's a pretty good benefit from a something that can take 30 seconds. So Dory, thanks so much for these four episodes. I have just absolutely loved being with you on these. You never, you just, you're, you're always great. I had high expectations and, and this was even better than I thought it would be. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mo. Awesome speaking with you. Hi, it's Mo Bunnell, your host here at Real Relationships, Real Revenue, and the author of The Snowball System, trained at over 15,000 experts all over the world on sound, efficient, authentic business development techniques. I am so excited to do a recap episode of everything I learned from our four episodes with Dory Clark. Dory is one of the people, just the human beings on the planet that, that I really love being around, that I look up to as just an amazingly helpful person, but somebody that just treats everybody with dignity and respect. And Dory's one of those people that everybody around her is better off when she is around. And I hope that, I hope that makes sense with you. Her expertise is defining your big idea, uh, building your entrepreneurial brand, whether that's inside an organization or outside building your own. Her book, Stand Out, is exceptional about how to stand out and to do things where you're attractive to others, that they find out about you and want to learn more or do business with you. And her new upcoming book, which we got a really great sneak peek into, The Long Game, just 100% aligns with all of our teaching in the snowball system, in our Grow Big training and everything else. So in this episode, I'm, I'm gonna recap the three things that I found most profound, the things that I enjoyed the most, and I can't wait to share those with you in this episode. But before we do that, don't forget that if you want to stay up to date in all the things that we're doing, our latest insights, our latest complimentary courses, our latest thinking on business development, just head over to growbigplaybook.com. That's growbigplaybook.com. You can sign up and you're getting a weekly newsletter that drops right in your inbox. You usually read it in three or four minutes and it's always going to help you grow your book of business, grow your relationships, and grow your career. So what did I learn from Dory? Three big things. The first one, which I really liked, and I hadn't thought of in, in this like succinct or acute kind of way, is the idea of building time to network with people, to interact with people might be a better word, just because networking has such a weird connotation, like Dory and I talked about, to, to meet and be around people that you just purely find interesting. And when years ago, gosh, it's almost 15 years ago, when we're developing our original Grow Big training materials, now over 15,000 people have gone through these programs, one of the key tenets, which people just absolutely love from our Grow Big training, is the idea of getting your relationships down to a short list of people that are the most important. And we have a name for that. We call it Protomoy List. It's a funny word, really great definition, Protomoy List. And what that means, what protomy means, a Greek word, is first among equals. I just thought, I stumbled across that word in the 1980s in college in my fraternity. And the idea of a protomoy list, first among equals, really stuck with me. I just like the definition. So if you can get your relationships down, not your entire Rolodex, but get down to the number of people that you feel like you can proactively keep in touch with, that you can reach out to, that you can see how they're doing, that you can be helpful in some way or another. If you can get down that list to the number of people you can keep in touch with proactively outside of a paid relationship once a month, the people you can proactively reach out to and help in some way or another once a month, then that's the number of people that should be on your protomoy list. And for most folks that come through our training, usually eight or 10 people is plenty. So while in some things in life, more is better, more will score, if you will, uh, when it comes to your protomoy list, less is more. You really wanna narrow your focus on the people that you're really being intentional about investing in at this point. Well, on our protomoy list form, there's four big uh, categories of people. One are clients, prospects, people that can that can do business with you. Um, one is strategic partners, people that can refer you to, to others. One of the four is interesting person. And I'd never thought about how 
in a way, I, we, we put it on that form as sort of a, a catch-all, if you will, of everything else. But we named it interesting person, I think, for a reason. It's so long ago, I don't even remember the thought process behind it. But it's because there's something about interesting people. Interesting people hang out with interesting people. And if nothing else, being around people that you're really excited about being around, you know, investing in those that you you find optimizing for interesting, as Dory, as Dory talked about, being around those people, A, is going to charge you up. But B, as I th- was, my mind was spinning, as Dory was talking about, all the people that I just frankly found interesting and wanted to invest in those relationships. And it turned out to have commercial advantage years later that I didn't expect. In one example, there's somebody that I just think really, really highly of. And I hung out with him on vacations and our families hung out together and things like that. And I just kept up with him just because I thought he was really cool. Years later, he called up one day, Facebook messaged me, called and left a voicemail and text messaged me and said, I've got to talk to you right away. Now, we haven't connected. We hadn't connected at that point in a long time. Turns out he's on the board of a very large publicly traded company. I had no idea. I had no idea. And that organization needed our help. Well, fast forward to just a week or two, and we had a contract with them to start on a path to train all of their experts all over the world. That was an incredibly meaningful project that ended up being a global worldwide project where we're training some of the most interesting people in the world. And it came out of just a relationship with somebody that I kept in touch with just because I thought he was interesting. I really, truly didn't expect anything in return. But this is one of those people that when you when you meet them, you just know they're interesting. You just know you want to be around them. You just know you want to be associated with them. And this was one of those. And as Dory was talking, I was playing it back that 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 larger contract didn't happen by accident. It happened because of the relationship that was formed years before. Really cool stuff. All right, let's go to the second thing that 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 I found really powerful with Dory. That last one, she called it infinite horizon networking. I think that's a really interesting way to put it. All right, second thing. Dory's idea on how do you say no to things or how do you get out of things that that maybe aren't the best use of your time is really powerful. We've got a model that's somewhat similar and it's called saying no nicely and it involves four quick steps. So when somebody asks you to do something and it's not quite the best use of your time, sometimes a really great way to get out of that is an answer that has four quick steps. One is, um, I'd like to consider this or I'd love to do it or some kind of connection to, um, I would like to something, either do it or consider it, but I can't because, this is your second step, of X. And X has to have a number. Um, I've averaged working more than 80 hours a week the last couple of weeks. Um, this isn't going to be aligned with me achieving um, some goal that I've got for the organization. The X would have a number. Um, anything that has to have a very specific number. The key here is in my first example, you can't say because I'm really busy. Well, everybody's really busy. But as soon as you say I've averaged over 82 hours a week the last couple of weeks, okay, now people are like, oh, that makes sense. So I'd, I'd like to consider it or I'd like to do it, but I can't because of X. I've got an idea, how about we, and now you come up with another solution. And then as a tangible next step, I would suggest X. What this does, it hits all the major ways people think. We're empathizing. We gave an analytical answer with a specific number. We have an aha kind of new idea, innovation, if you will. And we have practicality in the end. I would suggest X. Those four steps work incredibly well. We can pair that. We can pair that with Dory's idea of her triage at three levels. And I want to repeat these because I thought they were really great. Level one, ask for more information. Hey, why do you want to meet? Hey, why do you want me to do this thing? When appropriate, depending on who makes the request, I can totally see asking for more information as being a great way. Some people probably just won't even reply, right? You ask for more information. Level two, 
asked for very specific granular information, like an agenda. Her example of that was perfect, because then if, because now you might agree to doing the thing, but maybe not in the way that was suggested. Or in her example, I loved it how she said it, you might skip steps one, two, and three, because you know what they provided in the agenda is plenty. Let's go straight to step four. So maybe we'll be able to uh, do say yes to the thing they want, like meet and talk about things, but we can shrink the time. And then her third level, suggesting a totally different approach once you see the agenda. So this triage approach is just killer. Ask for more info. Probably a lot of things are just going to go away. Ask for very granular info. Level two, now that lets you figure out what you should really do before you say yes to it. And then three, suggest a completely different approach once you see what's being asked of you. And I like Dory's idea of an asynchronous example. Uh, recently, I was doing an interview that, that was going to be turned into uh, an, uh, uh, an article and another person was writing it at one of our partners and it would have taken like an hour call to have a whole interview and go back and forth and all that. And I was happy she suggested, the writer suggested, hey, why don't you just tape record your thoughts on X, Y, and Z, just send that voice memo over to me and I'll create the draft article for your uh, approval. It worked great. I could sit there and talk for 10 or 12 minutes, ramble on in a few places, but but be as concise as I could and everywhere and ship that off to her. And in a 15 minute exercise, we accomplished what normally if it was live would have been an hour with back and forth and all kinds and things. And let me tell you, her article was killer. It was so good. I don't even know if I changed anything significant. I made a couple little very small minor adjustments. It was so well written and it worked like a charm and saving me 75% of the time as it would have done normally. All right, last and third thing that I learned about as I talked to Dory was the power of pre-commitment. I really, really like that one. Here we're turning the defaults on that we're going to get together with certain people at certain times or whatever. So hacking our own habits, we could use the power of pre-commitment with an accountability partner, um, an accountability group uh, to get in touch with our clients. I think the trigger here could be at the moment you start to fear that you can't do the business development you want to do. Let's say a, a new project was just signed, you're ready to go, and you're going to be swallowed up for the next four or six months or whatever. When that trigger happens, when you worry, man, it's going to be hard to do my business development tasks, maybe that is the perfect trigger to say, okay, I got to keep my momentum going. How about I reach out to people right now, tell them what's going on, total transparency and authenticity, say, I want to keep in touch with you. It's really important. I'm going to get swallowed up over the next couple months. Can we plan three phone calls way out in advance, once a month for three months, just for 30 minutes, just for 20 minutes? Maybe it doesn't take much, but I want to stay in contact with you and I know I'm going to be crazy busy and I want to make sure it happens. Can we put these on the calendar? And you could even cite Dory Clark in this one and say, she told me to do it because it's a great, great, great idea. The power of pre-commitment. We could also use it internally for accountability partners or accountability groups, turn that default on and on a weekly basis, monthly basis, whatever cadence works for you, set those meetings up where you're talking with other folks about the right things and you don't have to at each meeting pick the next meeting set them up for a year in advance. If something's important to you, turn that default on and it's going to be better and you're going to be a better person for it. So those are my three big things that I pulled from all four Dory Clark interview episodes. I just really, really enjoyed it. I not only had fun, we laughed a lot, but as always with Dory, it's really insightful. So those were our three big things. That first one was infinite networking, infinite horizon networking, love that. I loved how her triage level of saying no, if I add our saying no nicely model on it, really nice blending of ideas there and then that, that power of pre-commitment. So that is a wrap of a really great series of episodes. I hope you enjoyed it. And don't forget, if you want more from us, if you want our latest thinking on business development, just head over to growbigplaybook.com and check it out. It takes 30 seconds to sign up. And, and what you're going to get is every single week, 
a nice little uh, email dropped in your inbox. It usually takes three or four minutes to read with insights and ideas on how you can take your book of business and your relationship and your career to the next level. And then for Dory, you saw all those tools that we talked about in the prior episodes. If you go to doryclark.com, D-O-R-I-E, Clark, C-L-A-R-K. If you go to doryclark.com, you'll get all those tools and actually a lot more that she didn't even mention over there. Really great stuff. Hey, let's take what we learned from Dory. Let's take our, our game to the next level. Let's play the long game. Let's have some fun with it. Have some success.